Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm uh, Vice Chancellor Gibor Basri, Ch Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion, and I'm here to welcome you today to the, this celebration of the 25th anniversary of American Cultures. We celebrate its roots in struggle and dreams and many, many people's hard work, including some of the people here today. The curriculum's beginnings share spirit with the fight for the dismantling of the South African apartheid system and some similar issues in the American educational system. At the local level, these were shaped by the actions of UC Berkeley students, their faculty allies, and the community surrounding us. And it's that history and these legacies that we honor today. The local anti-apartheid struggle began in March 1984 when the Longshoremen's Union in San Francisco at Pier 80 uh, refused to unload cargo from South Africa, even to touch it. This echoed black workers in South Africa battling the apartheid system. They were soon joined by the Campaign Against Apartheid, CAA, a UC Berkeley-based student organization. The divestment campaign began to, to gain momentum. One outgrowth of that was the uh, choice by the Faculty Senate eventually, after some debate, to start the American Cultures program. 25 years ago, the American Cultures curriculum had a focus on anti-oppression history, but with an intent to broaden this perspective out to many departments on campus. Post Prop 209 and other legislative actions, the responsibility of studying race as a requirement in the university retains its vitality. It has a renewed urgency, not only to bring students closer to understanding intercultural relations, this has been called cultural competence, but it's perhaps better termed cultural humility, but also to build a more just world in which power is challenged and social justice is understood and acted upon. Maybe you can turn the volume down just a bit. We are proud of where, we, where American Cultures is today. Just a few days ago, the numbers came in and it reached a record 11,533 students last year. I guess I should mention, this is the only requirement that all UC Berkeley students have to take. But those numbers are just a backdrop to the curriculum's increased vitality. This past year, American Cultures courses in engineering, peace and conflict studies, ethnic studies, legal studies, architecture, anthropology, and public health, all worked with community organizations, building student and faculty research into the developing fights for environmental justice, prison abolition, indigenous movements, the fight for K-12 education, and the arts and social justice. The higher education terrain is vast and the obstacles are numerous. But as there have always been, there is a pressing urgency for our university to face the social cleavages of our society with the best of its skills at hand. Great research, excellent teaching, and relevant and accountable public works and service. We must lead the way to the optimal multicultural society. The past years of the American Cultures curriculum have indeed built such strength, and we're proud to be here as a national model, not only for multiculturalism, but for the possibilities of researching and teaching social justice in higher education. With that, it's my great pleasure to invite EVCP Claude Steele up to introduce our keynote lecturer and respondent. Thank you, Gabor. It's a great uh, uh, pleasure to, to be here to um, uh, celebrate the American Cultures curriculum. Uh, I, I have for years gone around and in various talks about diversity argued for the importance of exactly this kind of requirement and as a general education requirement in, in uh, schools and universities everywhere. And so it's a great pleasure to be at a university that has one and that has pioneered one. So I, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I'm proud to uh, introduce Pedro Nogueira to the group who has uh, fought and has such a history of connection to this, uh, uh, this curriculum here at Berkeley and has fought for so many other, uh, in my mind, good causes. <laughs> uh, we've even uh, uh, together uh, argued against certain uh, famous uh, California regents about the nature of affirmative action some years ago. So uh, we go back and I admire him and his work greatly. 
Um, today is a celebration. He, he will be uh, uh, joined, I am uh, uh, to point out, uh, after his uh, talk for answers, for uh, question and answer and discussion, uh, by Lisa Garcia Badola, who is also uh, professor of education, political science, and chair of the Latino Policy Research Center here at, at Berkeley. So after the talk, she and he will take the stage and take over. Uh, Today is a celebration of the history of this uh, curriculum, but it is also uh, of the a celebration of the role that higher education can and indeed has played in social justice movements. I think that's an important uh, point. Uh, we know that UC Berkeley holds a special place in the collective imagination of how higher, higher education can affect larger world events. Uh, there's no other university I know with quite the same history in that regard that Berkeley has. Uh, being here can help us um, uh, recollect the halcyon days of beautiful trouble contributing to social justice. <laughs> That's not my phrase. I don't know who wrote this, but it's really good. <laughs> I'll take credit for it. <laughs> um, but it can also help us uh, have a greater conversation about what we uh, have learned and how it can prepare us for uh, what we now face as, uh, uh, as the major challenges in society and for that matter in higher education, challenges that we're all preoccupied uh, with. Uh, and both uh, Pedro and Lisa have uh, and are playing significant roles in crafting uh, uh, the inspiring terrain of uh, social justice uh, education. I can't think of somebody who's put more into social justice education than, than Pedro. Uh, he has uh, been a longtime scholar of social justice and uh, in the truest and most profound ways uh, from high school. Now, this again is research that I didn't know, but it's kind of revealing to me. Uh, from high school through college and graduate school, he has organized against racism and its manifestations, uh, such as uh, disproportionate suspension of black students, his activism at Brown as an undergraduate, on both the campus and in the community prepared him for his time at UC uh, Berkeley, where as a graduate student, he entered already uh, a veteran activist. And to quote Pedro, uh, what uh, motivated him at these various life stages was, quote, the belief that we could have an, an impact not only on the campus, but also larger events occurring in the world. I think that's a great ambition for, for us to uh, keep in mind, keep at the front of our uh, consciousness. At Berkeley, he is elected student body president, created the student party CalServe, which is still going strong today, uh, winning the majority student government appointments just last week. I don't, you, you knew this or you didn't know that? <laughs> um, and in the mid-1980s, Pedro was, was uh, crucial to building an alliance of undergraduate and graduate students, which led to a movement that compelled the university to divest. $4.6 billion in holdings, uh, do, holdings uh, in South Africa. Uh, Pedro, uh, uh, life and scholarship has shown us that organizing is both an art and a skill and a lifetime uh, commitment. It is the organizing tools perfected in the divestment campaign ultimately de uh, delivered, that ultimately delivered the American culture's uh, requirement, and today, a curriculum whose exploration of the country's ongoing social transformation has an intense uh, collective energy. Today we're celebrating 25 years of our history together and looking forward to the next chapter of curriculum development. So I welcome everybody to this celebration. Thank you. Good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, the provost, <laughs> Claude Steele, for that introduction. Um, last time I saw Claude, I think he was still provost at Columbia. <laughs> and he told me he didn't like that job. So I was surprised uh, when he, I heard about this move. But um, I'm, I'm glad for Berkeley that he's here. Uh, I, just, I do want to uh, share the story he alluded to. Um, one of the last things I did before leaving Berkeley was I was asked, along with Claude and uh, Patricia Gandera, who at the time was a professor at Davis, um, to speak before the regents about 
the potential impact of Proposition 209. And uh, it was interesting because that, that day, on my way into the building, I ran into Ward Connolly, who <laughs> was the champion of the effort to get 209 passed. And he was nervous. And um, he says, I want you to remember that I've never attacked you publicly. <laughs> I said, why would you think I would attack you publicly, Ward? <laughs> he said, I'm just reminding you of that. <laughs> and, uh, and we had, I thought, a, a civil exchange with the regents that day about the impact. And sadly, I think what we warned has come to pass. Um, and now with the most recent Supreme Court decision, um, uh, again, that, that fate being sealed unless the voters decide to do something different. And I hear this work in California to make that happen. Um, I do hope that those who are involved in that effort uh, will remember that the most important thing in any kind of political organizing effort is to educate people, <laughs> right? Um, and to, to help people to understand the issues. Um, I, I, I think, you know, uh, often I'm, I was asked, because um, there's been a lot of uh, events and, uh, related to um, the anti-apartheid movement, uh, and after Nelson Mandela's um, death not long ago, and I was asked to appear on several radio shows, and they were talking about the significance of Berkeley in that movement, because we had a very large movement here, which I'll come back to in a moment. And um, one of the questions was, why was Berkeley's movement so, so significant? And I said, well, one of the things that is not simply the size of the movement, which was a big part of it. I mean, when we literally, if you look at the pictures from those days, had thousands and thousands of people, which required them to deploy hundreds of police <laughs> to try to contain us. But the reason why we had that many people for so long is because of the educational work that went on, right? That it doesn't, it is, doesn't just happen. People don't just spontaneously follow you. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I, I, I think that very often people who think, pa feel passionately about an issue um, just assume everyone else will see it the way they do and don't realize that the real political organizing work is the educational work that goes on. And, and putting, investing the time in doing that work so that you're not just talking to each other, but talking to others who may not necessarily see things the way you do. Um, <clears throat> as I'm on the campus, I can't you know, help but having so many uh, great memories of this place. I had my office across the parking lot at the Institute for the Study of Social Change, as we called it back then, um, which was really hard to leave because I actually had a parking space too. So, uh, <laughs> but um, I also even remember this building was configured differently, and, and Mecha used to have um, an office here, and we had a lot of parties in this building, right? <laughs> this building used to rock. <laughs> And uh, so, so lots and lots of, of good memories about Berkeley. And uh, I, I came here in 1981 as a grad student in sociology. Um, and over those years, uh, came to know this campus and the people here very well. And so I'm glad to see so many old friends and familiar faces in the audience today. Uh, <clears throat> I want to start uh, in thinking about American cultures and why it's so important to think back to that time. Uh, because there really is a very direct connection between the anti-apartheid movement and the birth of American cultures. And that's because during the anti-apartheid movement, as we were organizing, one of the things that some of us kept saying is that the reason why this matters, the reason why the suffering in, a, in South Africa is so important is because of the parallels with the suffering in this country. Right? That is that we are, South Africa is, is in some ways a Im, uh, mirror image of us. Different, for sure, because the numbers are different, right? The history is different. But all you have to do is study the history of apartheid and realize that so much of that system that the, that the Afrikaners created was learned from this country, right? The Bantustan laws were, in some cases, borrowed from the policies to create reservations for Native Americans in this country. And many of the, the, the past laws and, and other apartheid laws were directly uh, mirrored after the Jim Crow laws that were adopted throughout this country in the South. And so the parallels are, are, are profound. And um, having gone to South Africa now on a number of occasions and learned more about that country, you can really see uh, so clearly why they fought for so long. 
Right? And by they, I mean the, <laughs> the supporters of the apartheid system, because that's a beautiful, rich country. And they did not want to give it up. <laughs> right? uh, but the other thing you realize when you go there now is that had they known how good they'd have it after, they might not have fought so hard. <laughs> right? Because, uh, and I'll come back to that later, there's a lot that hasn't changed in South Africa, um, even though the government has changed. But we did something very significant here um, in this movement. What was significant is that it was a sustained movement. You know, Berkeley has a reputation for protest in the spring. I'm, I'm not sure if that's happened this year, but as sure as you can, not yet, huh? just as sure as you can uh, count on the flowers blooming, you can be sure there will be protests in the spring at Berkeley. Um, and sometimes you can get cynical about that. Right? Uh, good weather means there'll be a protest, uh, there'll be a rally, there'll be something happening. Well, this was different, and what was significant about it was Ronald Reagan had just been reelected to a second term. Um, the papers were all saying this was a sign of the conservative mood in the country, and particularly amongst young people. Right? There was a great conservatism on the campus. And then, right after Reagan's reelection, there was this spark ignited in South Africa when the government decided to allow so-called Indians and coloreds to participate in elections for the first time. A reform that they thought would ease some of the political pressure, but instead had the opposite effect, and gave birth to the United Democratic Front, and the, for the first time in many years, open political protest in the country. Not led by the ANC, which had been banned for many years now, but led by Desmond Tutu and, and, and others who were openly protesting the system and refusing to participate in the election. And so once again, the government was forced, or felt forced, to respond with violence against these protests, which brought South Africa back on all the news. And so that then led to first longshore workers here in San Francisco refusing to unload cargo from a South African ship, led to Trans Africa uh, starting a series of protests with the Congressional Black Caucus at the South African Embassy and started a movement across the country that particularly took hold on college campuses and Berkeley especially. And as I said, I think what, what made Berkeley unique was its sustained movement, right? that it was not just what happened that spring in 1985, which actually coincided with me being elected student body president <laughs> right? while we were <laughs> while we were um, sitting in on, on Sproul Plaza, what we call Bico Plaza at the time. Um, but it also was, went on through the summer, went on into the fall for a full two years, right? and grew. It grew because we not only got um, students, including people in fraternities and sororities to participate, but we got staff and faculty. I remember one of our protests when faculty came out in gowns to join us on Sproul. And um, we had a, a teach-in at what we called Harmon Gym at the time, uh, with over 8,000 people. That was historic because 13 members of the regions showed up to an unscheduled meeting of the regions. And uh, throughout that, Mike Heyman, who was the chancellor at the time uh, and became a friend, um, would, uh, he and I would, would talk. And uh, because I was student by president, he would often be nervous because he was getting a lot of pressure from conservatives on the regions to crush the movement, right? to use, to deploy the police, to break heads. And I said, Mike, if you do that, you're going to make it worse. Right? You're going to make it much worse. You should be protesting with us. Right? If you're really against apartheid, you should work with us, not against us. Now, we couldn't get to that. <laughs> But the fact that we were able to communicate during much of that, I think, helped in some ways. It helped to allow us to create some dialogue amongst parties that would have otherwise been even more polarized. We take credit, for example, many people don't realize this, for getting the University of California headquarters moved. Because it used to be right here in Oxford until we decided to protest every single day and run sit-ins there. And then finally they said, you know, we're moving to Oakland. <laughs> Right. And, and so the sustained movement, I think, is really 
important. And, you know, to be fair, um, you know, because so, so many of us who have been involved in various causes know that you usually don't win, right? <laughs> usually you fight the good fight and you lose, right? Um, and that was true for Central America and many other causes that I've been involved in over the years. But why did we win? Why did, how is it possible that we got the regents, most of whom at the time had still been appointed by Ronald Reagan, to agree to divest? A lot of people don't realize it was really because of George Duke Majin, who was running for re-election against Tom Bradley, who was mayor of Los Angeles at the time, and decided that it was in his political interest to sway his appointees to vote in favor of divestment, which shocked everyone. Why would Duke Majin do that? Well, that's where this movement was so important, because we'd actually created public sentiment across the state that divestment was a winning issue. He wanted to be on that side. And many people think that that decision, combined with the fact that many of the voters who said they were going to vote for Bradley lied <laughs> and didn't when they got into the poll booth, um, swung the election to Duke Majin and prevented California from electing its first black governor. But that's how we got divestment. It was really um, this combination of political forces. And, and, um, and then to have just a few years later, Nelson Mandela released from prison, it was kind of like, you know, these were things we had talked about but never really imagined would happen. Um, so in some ways, uh, to be associated with a movement that actually succeeded um, was, uh, Really unusual, <laughs> um, but still highly significant. And because of the momentum that we'd built and, and, and we were really filling our oats, we said, well, now if we could do that, we could do more. <laughs> we can begin to dismantle some of the racial barriers here on the campus. And so we started thinking about the curriculum and looking at the faculty. And the fact was that although Berkeley had been one of the first campuses, to create an ethnic studies program because of student protest. It had become a place where ethnic studies was totally marginalized and where there were very, very few faculty of color anywhere else at the university. And we said, this has got to be our issue. For those of us who were students on the campus, we've got to make sure that we desegregate the campus, desegregate the curriculum. We needed to do that because we felt historically it was important. This was a state that was already becoming a majority, minority state, a state where people of color were the plurality. But also because we felt that it would not be prudent to settle for this victory and then simply, you know, go back to class. And so for those of you who don't know this, we were originally pushing for an ethnic studies requirement. That was the demand we had. We thought that's what would take to ensure that <clears throat> ethnic studies stayed vibrant and that also students began to learn about the experiences of people that were very different from themselves, which we thought was also important. Because the way the campus worked was if you were an engineer, you only took courses in engineering for the most part, and you didn't have to encounter right, the experience, the culture, the, the politics of people from different backgrounds. And, we said, no, that being a student at Berkeley should force people to deal with ideas and experiences that are different than their own. Right? And if we have to require it, we should do it anyway. Now, some of you got to hear from Mark Min earlier this week, I hope. Mark played a really critical role in taking these issues into the academic senate. I had already finished my doctorate and was kind of less involved by that time, although stayed in touch with the efforts. And and American Cultures was born as a compromise. Right? The academic senate didn't want an ethnic studies requirement. And in retrospect, I think it made sense because ethnic studies, it wasn't clear, could have handled a requirement. Right? Didn't have the faculty to offer the kinds of courses, the array of courses that we wanted to see students take. And although it was a compromise, it was a compromise that I think actually did something profoundly significant on the campus. Now, Ron Choi, who's here, who's played a critical role in this, and Troy Duster, uh, a mentor of mine, uh, also played a very important role, because what they did was they said, what we're going to do is create a requirement that could be offered anywhere on the campus. And we'll establish criteria that these courses need to meet, a comparative criteria, 
Right? So that you're not just learning about an experience, you're learning about multiple ethnic and cultural experiences in these courses. And we're going to give faculty resources to develop these courses, and we're going to get, bring faculty together to talk about their work, something that was unheard of at UC, that the faculty would actually talk about teaching. Right? <laughs> you know? Think about that. Right? We assume that if just because you have a PhD, you know how to teach the subject. I think many of us have realized that's not true, necessarily. Right? <laughs> a lot of people who might know the subject well but can't teach it particularly well. But to, so for what American cultures did was it got faculty talking about teaching and talking about different, dealing with very controversial issues in the classroom. How do you do that? How do you get people to hear things that may, they, they may find offensive, that may make them feel uncomfortable? How do you do that and push them and push the envelope a bit? And so I think that, that what happened here, and, and again, the context matters because Mike Heyman, followed by Chancellor Tien, adopted a motto that was very, very important. It was diversity and excellence. And at that time at Berkeley, Berkeley was more diverse than ever. Right? More diverse than ever in terms of undergraduate enrollment. And when, when Cheng Lin Tien defended it, Having gone to segregated schools as a Chinese student in Louisville, right, where he had to go to segregated classrooms with black students because they didn't have honorary white stat status for the Chinese in this country as they did in South Africa. Right? He got it at a very deep and profound level. And for to have Tien in his strong accent, an engineer talking about why diversity was important and confronting this association that many had, the idea that somehow by making it more diverse, you would lower standards. To have him champion that issue was profoundly important. And it made it possible to create this American culture's requirement and to have that requirement become embraced across the campus. And it took time to grow, right? That didn't, the number of courses we offered didn't just spring up overnight, took time. But it happened kind of naturally, right? Got people thinking about connections they could make, whether they were teaching in music or rhetoric or in the sciences. And that was a good thing. It was a good thing for Berkeley, but it's a good thing in American higher education, particularly right now. I would say right now the biggest challenge we face still is the segregation of higher education. I would say that one of the things that ethnic studies and African American studies has done across the country has created this marginalization of the non-white experience within the university. Why should we settle for that? Why shouldn't we insist that that experience, that those perspectives be in the mainstream curriculum? Whether you're in biology or political science or English literature, why should not black or Chicano or Native American experiences be represented throughout the curriculum? But because of how, of how it had evolved, we had come to accept this little piece of the university that we've been given, this department. Right? Failing to see that we were losing out on the bigger prize, the whole university. And so American cultures became a part of really breaking down walls on other parts of the campus. That's obviously a struggle that continues, right? Because we still have far too faculty of color in these other departments. But I would say that American cultures opened it up and began to change things uh, in the way people thought about these connections. And Having taught now on other campuses that don't have anything like an American culture's requirement, including Harvard and NYU, I would say that we need that kind of change in thinking. Because when we allow the academy to be ghettoized, <laughs> right, we reinforce these separations in ways that undermine our ability as a society to respond constructively to the change that's occurring. America is becoming a nation where no group will have the majority. By 2041, whites will no longer be the majority. It's already the case that white ch children are not the majority of children born in this country. That's our future. 
and they can build all the walls they want at the border, it's still going to happen. Because it's happening through childbirth. <laughs> right? People can have more babies. Right? So the change is inevitable. But it's not being embraced. In fact, I would say it elicits fear. Fear of the change. So the article, I don't know how many of you saw the article in the Times yesterday talking about the fact that the South, whites in the South are no, now vote solidly Republican. You know, the, the, completely. And it's creating not only more polarized politics, but may also create a Senate now controlled by Republicans in the near future. And much of that, and the article, I think, correctly attributed to, is the fear of racial change. Right? Fear of a black president. Fear of foreign accents. Right? Fear of a country that they thought they knew becoming someplace else. Well, I think most of us would know that change is inevitable. Right? That these changes, in fact, if you look at it, Historically, if you look at the contemporary situation, immigration has always been good for America. Always been good for America. It renews America. Right? The cities that attract more immigrants are the cities that have the greatest economic growth. Right now, Detroit is dying, except where? In that one small Mexican community in West Detroit, where it's vibrant with small business. New Orleans, after Katrina, what was the first community in New Orleans to become rejuvenated, not through government assistance. It was the Vietnamese community in Versailles. And they were not only able to rebuild their community, they were so successful, they elected a Republican Vietnamese immigrant to Congress. Think about that, never happened before. <laughs> he only lasted two years, one term, especially because he voted in favor of Obamacare. They said, done with that, right? But. The point is that immigration brings change, almost always for the better. The mayor of Schenectady, New York, uh, decided, um, Schenectady is one of those old industrial towns in upstate New York, and he decided a while ago the only way to rebuild Schenectady was to recruit immigrants. And for some reason he decided it was Guyanese immigrants that would do it. And he went down to Brooklyn and went to churches and laundromats to recruit the Guyanese. And for some strange reason, the Guyanese moved to Schenectady and bought up old abandoned houses. And guess what? Schenectady is back on the rebound again because hardworking Guyanese people are rebuilding Schenectady. Mike Bloomberg said it, and Giuliani said it before that. Immigrants have made New York City almost uh, recession-proof. Right? Almost recession proof. Because even when the Wall Street collapsed, the small businesses created by immigrants kept people working, kept money flowing in the city. So part of what we've got to do is we've got to have a, a way of talking about these issues that are changing our country to get people to understand that they need not fear change. In fact, we've got to embrace change. Right? If it weren't for those immigrants coming to this country, Oh, white people will be in trouble. Right? That is, anybody who's thinking about retirement is actually dependent upon these children getting a good education. They should be the strongest advocates. Because that's how the system works. Right? It's the current employees who support the older retirees. But we don't see these interconnections. Why? Because we continue to have blinders that let us think that if we can write off Oakland, we can write off Richmond, we can write off whole communities as though they are, they are like a distant land, not recognizing that if you write off a place to become unlivable, guess what? There will be consequences in your communities too. So when we desegregate the curriculum, when we break down these barriers, what we do is we get people to see connections that they might not otherwise see because we're so born with bias. Bias created by where we live, by who we're raised by, by the communities we go to, the schools we attend. Because as you know, despite Brown 60 years later, our schools are highly segregated throughout America. So if we don't find ways to desegregate the academy, we're really in trouble. 
This is about our future as a society. And so the work that American Cultures is doing, I think is critical for people to understand that future. And I say that as having been one of the people to teach one of the first American Culture courses, which was ironic. It was actually a course that was developed by a colleague, Geraldine Clifford, Education 40, called Experiencing Education. She taught in the fall. I said, I, I like that. I like, I, I like to teach a version of that. She said, why don't you teach the spring version? She got mad when my course was 10 times larger than her course. <laughs> She actually stopped teaching after a while. But what I loved about it, and that course grew each year that I taught it, until the end we were in the life science building with over 350 students, was it was a way to challenge students to think outside the boxes. Right? One of the central themes of the course was that you could use a study of American education to understand the evolution of American democracy. Because the fact is that who we educate has always sent a signal of who we think matters, who we think has the rights of a citizen or a person even. Right? That's the reason why the Brown decision was so important. Even if it didn't lead to genuine desegregation, what Brown did was signal an end to American apartheid, set the legal precedent for ending racial barriers in housing and employment and everywhere else. It was not just Brown, it was Title IX, did the same thing for women. Later, the ADA did the same thing for people with disab disabled, uh, disabled Americans. <clears throat> and Lau versus Nichols did the same thing for children who don't speak English as their first language. That is, if you follow the history, what you see is that the courts have always ruled that you cannot deny a child a right to an education, even an undocumented child, right now. When Prop 187 was adopted, the court said, well, guess what? You could do 187, but those kids still have a right to an education in this country. Our public schools have always been far more accessible than any other institution, though also profoundly unequal. And by studying that history and understanding both the equity dimensions of education, but also the profound inequities, I found it was a great way to understand and help students to understand why America is the way it is. One of the activities that I had my students do was to um, reflect on how they had been tracked in school. And what was always interesting about that activity was the most privileged students always said, you know, I, I don't recall. I always was gifted. From early on, I just was gifted, and, and I was always in honors, and, I, and everything was I just, was, that's just the way it was. But I always have some other students who describe experiences where their parents had to fight for them to get removed from a bilingual class or from a special ed class or into an honors class. They're telling the stories, and by hearing each other's stories, students also learned about privilege and the ways in which privilege denies them the ability to empathize with people with very different experiences. And in addition to getting them to think deeply about their own education, I said, you know, we've got to use this class as a way to get people to think deeply about issues they may not agree with. And so I deliberately set up debates in my class. Right before Prop 209 was passed, I got Jack Citron, who was professor in political science, to come and debate me about affirmative action in class. And some of you who know Citron know he not afraid of saying what he thinks. <laughs> Still is not, Still is not right? <laughs> but I gave him credit for being willing to come to class and have an intelligent debate because if you can't hear the other side, how can you possibly know how to argue against it? Right? And Citrin knew how to make the case very well. I thought I did better, but I think he still, <laughs> nonetheless, could make the case. And then I invited John McWhorter to come. Some of you remember John McWhorter, who I think originally taught an American cultures course <laughs> in linguistics, and then produced a book called Losing the Race, in which he uh, accused black students and many black professors of engaging in sabotage, self-sabotage through uh, what he called um, embracing victimhood. And we had a lively exchange. And it was, one of the things that was interesting is I, I predicted then 
I said that even if I win the debate, John is going to win because John will go off to be placed at the Hoover Institute and continue to have a career as a pundit. Well, I was wrong. It wasn't Hoover. It was the Manhattan Institute in New York instead. <laughs> and, uh, but the point is I wanted to create a context for informed discussion of important issues. And I think that's what a good education should do for students. It should not simply tell them what they want to know or what they believe already. It should push them to think. It should challenge their assumptions and beliefs. And the experience I had in the course got, I think, many students to do that. I, I constantly run into former students today who remember and say, oh, I took Ed Vorty with you back at Cal, back you know, many years ago. I had one student. Um, who took my course and she said, uh, you know, Professor Noguera, I, I want you to meet my parents. And I said, why? She said, well, since I've taken your course, I've decided to become a teacher. And my parents are not happy because I was pre-med originally. <laughs> so now I need you to explain to them why being a teacher is, is worthwhile. And I said, really? You want me to talk to you? <laughs> and we had a very interesting guy. They, weren't, they didn't leave very happy, but, um, but the point was that it was... Um, it did change many students, uh, change their choices. Um, I remember one point we started um, a tutoring program so that we would give students credit to go work in different um, schools and tutoring organizations out in the community. And we, at one time we were working with a school in West Oakland. And I had students from the course who were out there tutoring in West Oakland. And um, what was interesting about that is students who would have otherwise never connected we're connecting through that work and developing relationships that transcended their differences in race and class because they were all connected to doing important work with these young people out there in West Oakland. Right. And what I think is important about that is sometimes I, I think that when we do diversity work, we, it's too much in our heads. It's too abstract. It's not connected enough to actual experience. And if we don't show people, if people don't have the experience of breaking down barriers and transcending these differences, they really don't know how to continue to do that work when they leave the university. And so <clears throat> I enjoyed it for it, and I, I continue to teach versions of that course now at NYU. And um, I, I give you know, great credit to American Cultures for giving me that opportunity and for um, creating a setting here at, at, at Berkeley where many courses like that have been offered. So I, I, I want to say that I think what American Cultures is doing portends well for the future. I, 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 my only hope is that it can expand beyond Berkeley to go into other campuses, that others could learn. I was trying to explain this to the president of NYU, John Sexton. I said, you know, since you didn't go through the first phase of diversity, right? <laughs> you, you skip that space, you get to go to 2.0, right? right? Which is, you could do it right now and begin to diversify the academy and the curriculum and, and recruit faculty and students into disciplines without marginalizing them into ethnic studies and, and programs like that. Well, they haven't seen the value in that yet at NYU. But I would say that is the real work that has to happen in higher education today. That is to continue to break down the barriers, continue to, to challenge the notions of what excellence is and, and who deserves to be there and, and what constitutes legitimate scholarship. Those kinds of exchanges, so, so critical to what it means to be an educated person in the 21st century. I know from my experience in academia that, that the tendency to reproduce what we already know is so powerful even when the people doing it are liberal and open-minded. Right? I know it because I'm in the meetings. I'm in the meetings when they're looking at candidates, and the only candidates that seem to be fitting are the ones that are just like them. And if I weren't there, I know that those people of color from different backgrounds would never even get considered, except that I'm there pushing the issue, making everybody uncomfortable. But that's what we've got to do sometimes, make people uncomfortable. Right? Got to raise the issue and challenge the orthodoxy and challenge the assumptions. I, I was invited over the holidays to a friend's 
home. This was, a, again, a very progressive colleague. And we're there, and we're drinking beer and wine. I noticed I'm the only person of color. And she said, I'm so glad you came. I, I said, I guess so. Otherwise, you'd have had only white people. <laughs> and she looked at me all nervous. I, I said, you wouldn't have wanted that, would you? <laughs> and she didn't even know what to say. Because to her, it seemed normal. And we will know we're making progress when white people say, you know what, this is wrong. There are no people of color in the room here. <laughs> Something's wrong here. Something's got to change. Because sadly, we are not all in those rooms when faculty are being hired and new courses are being developed and proposed or when syllabus is being created and we're trying to think about what readings to assign. And that's what American cultures has done, is it gets different people in the room, it encourages thinking that challenges some of that orthodoxy. So I, I want to just say that that work, I hope, will continue for many, many more years and expand to many other campuses. I, I encourage Berkeley to invite other campuses to come and visit, people, representatives from other universities, to show them the work of the American Culture Center, what they could learn from it. Because I think that this work is, uh, worthy of being um, decimated elsewhere. Uh, Alex de Tocqueville, the French philosopher visiting this country in the 1820s, wrote back to a friend in France and asked a really profound question. He said, imagine a country made up of people from all over the world, speaking different languages, different religions. He says, what will hold them together? That was to Tocqueville's question. And I would say that question is as pertinent now as it, is, it was then. Right? What will hold us together? Um, and as we can see, the, the, we are challenged, right? Challenged by our differences, challenges, um, political differences, but that's also cultural, racial differences, differences in lifestyle. Um, but this question of what will hold this country together is of vital importance. The answer almost always has been education. We've looked to education, both K-12 and higher education, as an institution that will create something, some connections that transcend our differences. And so as flawed and as fraught as these institutions are, I'd say the work we do here to challenge the boundaries is so critical to the kind of country we will become. I think, as, particularly as I get older now, I, I, what, the, the thing I've learned most, more than anything else, is that change is slow. Right? Change is slow. It's always incremental. Right? That was the thing. I th it took a while to, to get that. But particularly going to South Africa, it really dawns on you, wow, change is slow. You know? I, mean, I heard um, Bishop Desmond Tutu say this. He said, you know, people say we've changed so little. He said, Millions more children now go to school than ever before. Millions more people now have access to water, have access to homes. He says, you can't tell me things have not changed. Now, you could say this, that there's still the, the, the townships still look a whole lot like the Bantu stands, and, and, and in many ways, um, it doesn't seem as though the country's changed that much. But the fact is that change is occurring. The real question is, is it occurring in the right direction? <laughs> Right? Is it, are we moving towards a more equal, more equitable society? I say that question is true for us today. I believe that our future is going to be contested. <laughs> There's no guarantees. And if we want it to be a future that is more just and equitable, that we've got to be involved right now, where we are, doing what we do, to challenge and to push and to raise questions to ensure that others have opportunities that will continue to allow this university and this country to be, live up to its ideals. So I'm, I'm happy to be back. I'm happy to be part of this uh, celebration. Uh, I want to thank uh, Victoria and all the staff at the American Cultures uh, Center for um, extending this invitation to me. Thank so many friends and students. And just say, uh, you know, even now, having been away from Berkeley for 14 years, whenever I see a cow shirt, whether it be in some other remote part of the Bears, I always go Bears to the person. <laughs> a lot of times they look at me like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> this is just a t-shirt someone gave me. 
<laughs> but I do feel a strong connection to this place. Uh, and, and that connection is because of the work we did to shape this place into a university that begins to live up to its ideals. So thanks for having me. Can we go up now? And Pedro and Lisa are going to take some questions from the stage, and also Lisa has a couple of questions to begin everything off. It's all right, Froggy, we'll get to it, don't worry. <laughs> it's great enthusiasm. So I want to begin by just thanking Pedro. I, I feel like I've been limping toward the ends of the semester for the last <laughs> couple of weeks and feeling decidedly unoptimistic in general. And, um, for really inspiring, I think, all of us in, uh, to think about the work that we do in a different way. Um, and I'm going to take the, we're going to open it up uh, for questions. I guess, Victoria, do you want people to, but I want to start with um, asking you to think, tell us a little bit about what you think 2.0 should look like. Mm. Um, and thinking about, we, you know, we've had American cultures for 25 years. I don't know if you know of all the wonderful work that's been going on in terms of the Engaged Scholarship Program, which is very, much related to what you were talking about in terms of having experiential um, knowledge be part of the curriculum. And we were privileged to have funding from Haas and Victoria's tremendous energy and Susan and other people to push this program forward and really integrate that into the curriculum. Um, but as you have as you pointed out on the other aspects in terms of faculty diversity, in terms of staff diversity, administrative diversity, Berkeley still not where it could be, and the student population as well, right, in terms of undergraduate admissions. So what should we be doing to really make American cultures reach its full potential? I, I think um, I, I was saddened to hear that um, some of the faculty development work that happened early on has stopped, right? That, that is that uh, the, the funding to give faculty time to think about courses to develop new courses, that that um, is not happening. I, I think you need that. You know, mm -hmm. I think you need to give people a chance to um, really think about what they're going to do. You know, the, the tendency <laughs> is always there for faculty to stick with what they know. They say, this worked last year. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> I'll add a it's couple easy. new articles, yeah. but I'm going to just do this again. <laughs> and if you really want people to continue to grow and to change, you've got to give them time to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that that would be really important to continue to see um, because you don't want it to get stale. You want, you want it to be vibrant. You mm -hmm. want it to be um, uh, current. And um, you want, you want, for that to happen, faculty need time to reflect and to, and should be encouraged to think. I would also explore, I don't know if it's happening now, um, getting faculty to develop courses together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even across discipline or um, to, to kind of push each other in thinking through some of these ideas, which, you know, we, we teach in isolation mm -hmm. uh, so much. And, um, it limits, I think, our own growth as, as intellectuals. So I, I, I think that would be another area to look at, too. Yeah, I have to say, as a chair of the American Cultures Committee, for any faculty in the room, one of the best things about that committee is you actually get to read syllabi from across campus. And it's, you know, I don't see courses in English or in under regular basis, but it, it really has helped my own teaching mm -hmm. in terms of just seeing what other people are doing, right? right? And the ways they construct their, their courses. Um, and to open it up to the floor, I think in the far back, you, you were the first one with your hand up, so. Black jacket. Yeah, my, my question is if you could talk a little bit about, because I feel like, in a sense, the American culture makes it um, easier, a little bit harmless, to not be accountable in terms of really being touching the political and racism topics. <coughs> so if you could talk a little bit about that, because I feel like a lot of times, like, like I'm a poli sci major and competition <laughs> to get more of a person of color. But the one thing I heard is like, oh, I'm taking American cultures class. <laughs> <laughs> Only one of which is offered in political science, right, Victoria? And taught by a lecturer, I'm, I'm assuming? Yes. You're, you're talking about a particularly difficult department, but yes. <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting you say that. Um, I remember one of the first, we did protest about lack of faculty diversity. And one of the first departments we protested was political science. And it was very convenient, because political science and economics were next door to each other, so we did both at the same time. <laughs> um, and we raised the questions, and it, and it got people very upset. And we, I remember there was a guy named Emeka Azira at the time who was on campus, who was a very tall, loud Nigerian who scared the hell out of uh, the chair of the department. 
And, um, but what we were doing, we were raising the question of, of, of hiring practices. And, and, and I think we've got to keep raising the question. Now, so I, I, I would say that American cultures doesn't solve that problem at all. We've got to keep pushing that envelope. Because as I said before, the tendency is for them to keep reproducing themselves. Right? And so we've got to find ways to keep pressure on, keep scrutiny on, so that they are looking at different candidates. They are bringing them in to give them a chance. Um, they're using the postdocs as another way to develop new scholars. All those things have to continue to happen. That's in, separate from American cultures. They're two different issues entirely. Plaid shirt in the... What's that, Ricky? <laughs> you know, um, sadly, I, I think, no. I think you need a movement. Um, in the absence of a movement, the tendency is always to revert back. Right? That's what we've seen around school desegregation. Right? Think about this. In, when, right after the, the, the Supreme Court rendered the decision in 54, Eisenhower sends troops to Little Rock. I mean, when has that happened? Since the Civil War. <laughs> well, when is, have you ever heard President Obama even talk about school integration? Not a word. Not a word from this administration about the fact that our schools are more segregated now than they have been in 30 years. I would say it's because why? There's no movement pushing the issue, saying this matters, and you need to de deal with it. Right? Uh, it's, it's ironic, because three weeks ago, the US Department of Education, the Civil Rights Division, just came out with a study on disparities, which was the first time that had come out. So look at, the, look at the contradiction between the profound disparities in funding and learning opportunities for kids. They mentioned the fact that uh, this high rate of uh, suspensions for African-American preschool children across the country. Right? And then two weeks later, the Supreme Court issues this ruling, says states uh, need not consider race. So that they can um, allow these referendums to basically nullify affirmative action. So I'd say, why does that happen? There's no movement pushing it. Right? There's no, affirmative action was born in the context of a movement. American cultures was born in the context of a movement. When the movements go, the, 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 the pressure to embrace change also subsides. So I'd say there's got to be vigilance. There's got to be a willingness to continue to push and raise the issues and, 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 and take actions to force people to keep the issues alive. So, I'd say in the absence of that, um, that we will not see the kind of change that we want. Lisa? Um, so I guess the question, he kind of touched on it, so I guess I'll tailor it in a different way in another direction. Like, as these group of police students and a lot of us having taken American cultures classes and a lot of us will be going to different institutes, like what's something that we can do as students when we're entering these other institutes to try and encourage the creation of American culture requirements at different institutes? And I guess like the second part to that, I think with like talking about the idea of movement, I think a lot of the things that's hindering movement nowadays is like the division among races. Mm. Like how do you bring like different student groups, different organizations together when we're organize, organizing around like central spaces of race? Like how can we create more of like coalition between black, brown, Asian Americans? Because I feel like that is still present here very much so on campus. Like you're gonna get all these different organizations like yeah, organizing, but how can we come together as a space as students to really push the movement forward beyond just like, <coughs> be like segregated or like racial? So um, I'll take you back to the divestment movement for a second. So w during that movement, we created an organization on campus called United People of Color. Right? And it was United People of Color that actually created CalServe. But CalServe, if you look at the name, it says nothing about race. <laughs> Right? We deliberately knew that CalServe had to be a bigger umbrella that would in, in, in embrace and engage broader number of students from different backgrounds. And uh, even though we also knew that students of color had to be organized and, and, and prepared to, to lead. 
Um, so I would say that that's still got to be. I think we've got to constantly look for ways to build broader coalitions. Right? If you're going to have um, influence, you cannot settle for just being in your own comfortable groups. Um, and that's the reason why I spoke before about the importance of education and working with people from different backgrounds um, at, uh, on the campus. I'd say when you leave here, and if you want to see um, initiatives like American Cultures Embrace, it would help to, to first of all, help them understand um, the limitations of the way they've done it. Um, you know, I, I went to Brown as an undergraduate. Brown still has what they, they call a, a third world center, right? Which I laugh about, even I was very active when I was there. I said, you know what, the third world doesn't call itself the third world anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and they're afraid to change it because they're, they're afraid that, if, that it'll be seen as somehow um, reneging on, on some commitments. We, we should never get so attached to ways of doing things that we can't embrace change and growth, right? And I think that that's what happens a lot of times in universities, it happens anywhere, um, that, we, that people get, um, they get stuck in one way of seeing the world, one way of doing things, and even as the world's changing all around them, can't see, you know what, maybe we need to change how we're organized ourselves, how we've organized and constructed this curriculum, um, who we're hiring, and, and getting people open to change is, is not easy. Not easy by any means. It, it takes real work. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you honestly, I'm very happy for Berkeley you've got Claude Steele here because he's a person who gets this at a very profound level from his own work as a scholar. Um, I think it's going to be a challenge for him uh, to push these departments right, about their hiring. And so it'll be interesting to watch how he's able to pull it off. But, uh, you, you know, uh -huh. we'll buy you buy me some popcorn, popcorn to watch. <laughs> but it's interesting, you know, when I was here, the only senior administrators of color were always in that business services area, right? We had Dan Bogan and uh, Mitchell, and you know, that was kind of the spot, or, or maybe even lower down where um, you know, the assistant vice chancellor of student affairs, right? Uh, or financial aid. Um, but um, you know, to see a, a, a person like Claude now as provost um, is a real barrier breaker right, um, for the campus. And I think it opens up new possibilities. And that's the kind of, of pushing that we need to continue to encourage. I think it's not on. Three groups. <laughs> Because of the criteria. Right. They, mm -hmm. they thought that that was the wrong way to look at the problem. Too formulaic. Too formulaic. Uh, so what would you recommend for some kind of a change? Because it's 25 years. I mean, you're beyond five groups. Yeah. <laughs> three. <laughs> it requires three, just so. <laughs> So you know, I mean, I think that's a legitimate question. Um, I don't have an easy answer for it. I know because they had that requirement then, I had to think about, okay, which white ethnic group am I going to include? And I, I decided to include the Irish. And because I include the Irish, I spent a lot of time studying the Irish experience in this country, which is where I found a lot of parallels with particularly African-American experience in this country. Um, so I think there's a, an advantage to that. At the same time, I think that these by reinforcing the categories, we also have, right. it does have the tendency of, of, of not acknowledging some of the ways in which the society keeps changing. Increasingly, white people in America don't identify by ethnic group, right? They identify as a racial group, perhaps, but not by ethnic group. That's different if, depending on where you live, but I'd say that, particularly in California, less so. Um, and so maybe uh, race and ethnicity are not the primary or the only categories we should be looking at. Maybe we should look at other categories like sexuality or class and other things. So, but I, you know, I think you need people to think through how to do this and 
how to create it in ways that, because the other, you know, what you don't want to lose is uh, because th there's always going to be the tendency to avoid looking at the hard issues, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And race are the hard issues. And even though if we, we look at race skeptically, because uh, knowing that it's a political construct that's arbitrary and mm -hmm. flawed, at the same time, we also know it, it's, you know, it has a history <laughs> and we can't just wish it away. And um, so I, I think we need to be very thoughtful in how we think about modifying it, but, but we should not be afraid of modifying it. And, and if I can just add, just to say, within the committee, we talk about this every year. I've now served on the committee for three years. I've chaired it this year. Um, the, the, and in our interpretation of, you're not limited to that. If you want to talk about five groups, you can. If you want to talk about sexuality, you can, right? Um, and, and one of the things we've really pushed uh, new, solo, new, new courses to do is really uh, break down the black-white binary and question categories, right, in that kind of fundamental way. Um, one of the issues, though, is it's still a US-based requirement, and that's also another question in the global world. Our worry is that if you open it up and diversity becomes everything, then it's nothing, right? right? And so how do you, understanding the politics around both its creation and its maintenance, and the fact that there are sectors of this campus that continue to think it's, it's, it's an unreasonable expectation to ask students to do this, I think we have to be very thoughtful and very um, strategic about what kinds of openings we create in terms of watering it, potentially watering it down, and not allowing it to do the good work that it's done for the last 25 years. But if we can. As the sole political scientist who's teaching in American <laughs> culture school, I'd like to. Can we just? I'd like to broaden the question a bit. Uh, going back to your comments about the New York Times article about how people in the South are voting, 60 years after the rise of civil rights in this country, could you speak to the fact that we still have across the entire country people surrendering to their fears regarding diversity yeah. and willing to use the political forces that they have available to them? And the Supreme Court decision about the Michigan Affirmative Action is an example where you can take local majorities to work against diversity why this continues in an educated country like ours to be so persistent? Well, I would first question how educated we are. <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, if you, once you travel the country, particularly into um, the, the, the heartland and, and some of those red states, you realize there's a lot of deeply ingrained bias in, the, in this country. Um, very uh, disturbing article in the New Yorker two weeks ago about coal mining in West Virginia. Some of you will remember just about three months ago, they couldn't drink the water in half of West Virginia because of contamination. And um, the state used to be demo solidly democratic. It's gone now solidly Republican. And the coal industry and the chemical industry control the politics of the state. And part of what drove it there was race, right? politically. Um, Obama's uh, running, right? Drove, took it over the top. And, um, and so what you see in the article is the people of West Virginia who are overwhelmingly white and very, very poor um, voting against their own self-interest. Right? I mean, they can't drink their own water now. And there's not a single politician in the state who's willing to stand up to the oil industry they, or the coal industry because they're they know they won't get reelected. So there's a, you know, when you, you start to realize there's this huge disconnect in our country between what's in our real interest and, and, and where our politics have evolved. And um, I, I attribute that both to, you know, the lack of education in many cases, um, I, the xenophobia that's out there, um, fear of, uh, particularly as it relates to race, um, and, and, and the kind of ideological blinders that are reinforced by the, you know, the, campaign spending that allows those with the most money <laughs> to spend as, you know, as much as they want. So they were bombarded with these messages that, you know, you, you read about these people, you know, right now who refuse to sign up for health insurance who are in desperate need of health care. <laughs> I mean, what are they, I, you know, why would you do that? But, um, you know, they sold them a bill of goods that somehow Obamacare was bad for them, so they're not going to do it. Even though they need health care, they got it on dialysis, and they have no means to pay for it. So, um, you know, I, it, it, we have a huge problem in this country with respect to how to get, how to move beyond some of these binaries that are, limit us. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, because I do get to travel the country quite a bit, I, I see possibilities 
for getting people to start to understand their common interest. I'll give you one example. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma last June, um, and I'm going back again this June. Tulsa has gotten a lot of attention recently. Is, is one of the first cities, and Oklahoma, one of the first states, is the first state to adopt universal preschool. Right? Every child in high quality preschool. And, um, and when I was in Tulsa last year, they, they, were, they wanted to take it further. They said, we want to build a safety net for all children, support systems for all children in Tulsa. The majority of children in Tulsa schools are children of color. Right? Uh, and it's Republicans and Democrats, they said, well, uh, you know, and I'm like, wow, I'm trying to understand the mindset. What, what's, what's making it possible for them to do this? And they said, well, this is in our interest to educate our kids. <laughs> I said, I agree, but why don't you get other people to see that too? <laughs> so, I mean, there are moments and, uh, where you see people moving beyond some of these uh, limitations, but unfortunately not nearly enough. Yeah. If people are interested in Tulsa, there was a nice story on NPR yesterday morning about a program, about yeah, about that program that allows education for the mothers and training for the mothers while their kids are in those preschools. Your next, or where, who has the microphone? Yeah. I have it. How y'all doing? Uh, <laughs> my name is Destiny. I'm a third year undergraduate. Um, we spoke earlier about how like political organization work, like the most powerful thing one can do is to educate. Um, and uh, so SCA five is going to be on the ballot in 2016. It may not. <laughs> it may not. Well, I'm passionate about making sure that it's going to be on the ballot <laughs> in 2016. Um, and I wanted to know, like, what do you all think is the role? Uh, and if that does pass, it will actually reinstate affirmative action in the state of California. I uh, wanted to know, like, what do you all think American culture's role is to, like, educate the students and staff and faculty around um, affirmative action should be? Well, I hope there will be a lot of lively discussion about it. Because um, there are many, many Asian Americans in the state who are threatened by it. I'd see it as particularly not in their interest to support it. And um, I would hope that you, you can't just call them names. <laughs> I think you've got to engage them right, about why it might be in their interest to support something like this. Um, and those are complex issues that we've got to take on. But I think we don't take it on. Um, even if it gets on the ballot, it may not go the way we hope. So. Um, the real work is going to be the educational work, and, and don't settle for, I mean, a campus is a good place to start it out because you have a very large Asian American population here, but then take it beyond the campus out into the communities to have these discussions about what's really in the interest. It's interesting, um, the um, American Medical Association, when Prop 209 was coming up, issued a report saying that if Prop 209 is adopted, it will lead to a shortage of Latino doctors, which will produce a health crisis in Latino communities because Latino doctors are more likely to serve Latino communities. And so even if you're not interested in affirmative action, you're disinterested in your health, <laughs> you should vote to support this. And I thought it was a very compelling argument because it takes people beyond narrow sense of self-interest into thinking about broader common interest. And I think those are the issues we've got to keep thinking about as we Talk about how to, how to address these issues, these barriers. And we you have to start now, not in 2016. <laughs> we have about five minutes left, and I thought, saw three hands, so we'll try to get to everybody. You got Andy Barlow up here, too. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, I had a question to go back to your mass movement thought. Berkeley High School is the only high school in the United States that we know of that has a black history department, and it has had one for the past two decades. It is struggling at this time because there has not been a mandate from the communities to put black history departments in secondary schools in California, nor in uh, middle schools or elementary schools. How do you think American cultures could be a mass movement generator for that kind of institutionalization? Because the energy in American cultures is so high, and the interest in the information is so lacking, children are, people are actually starving to get this information about everybody else's culture. Yeah. They actually want it, but don't know where to go to get it or how to get, a, get it. Can you suggest something that might be beneficial? And also, let me make one other statement. Um, I do a lot of hanging out over at the, uh, the um, Ethnic Studies Department, even though I'm in School of Public Health. And um, I read a lot of the Native American stories because we never got them in elementary school or in high school or anywhere. And this is how I have found the Native American population in my life, is that I've actually made use of the resources that UC Berkeley has. Thank you. 
All right, so this might be heresy, but um, I'll, I don't mind. Um, I, I'm going to actually speak at Berkeley High this afternoon. And I did a lot of work there because I was on the school board and we did a big study at Berkeley High School trying to understand these racial disparities. Now, that black studies department's been there since 1969. I know the people who started it. I would say it, it's, a, it's an example of what I was talking about before. Be, it, was, it was born during a period of struggle, right? So it was, that's how it was created. And then it just sat there, right? And it, and it served black students who wanted to take those courses. And that is a lack of growth. It should have been serving all kinds of students, right? Because guess what? White students, Latino students, Asian, they all should be learning about those courses, right? But they, was, they settled for their little department, their little control within the school, instead of realizing, you know what the real work is to take this throughout the school, right? And influence, and because what, that, that department's been there, and black students are, are being devastated at the high school. It's had no bearing, or very little bearing, on the academic supports that those students need. And so, it, it, to me, it speaks exactly to what I was talking about before. We settled for that. We say, oh, we, how great it is, we've got this, instead of realizing, you know what, this is just a start to what we really need. We need a much bigger change here, right? And that never occurred. I mean, you know, I heard they're trying some things now. They're still working, so I'll give them credit at Berkeley High for to keep working at it. But I think it's, we, get, we get stuck on certain things that prevent us from Recognize, you know, we've got to be willing to continue to grow. And we've got to be willing to ask tough questions of ourselves. Is this working the way it should? Are we getting the results that we, we hope for? And if not, let's, let's rethink it. Let's do it differently. And, and I think very often in um, academia that doesn't happen. People kind of get calcified and stuck in place. So. Hi. Um, I'm Amber, and I'm a faculty assistant up at the business school. And I wanted to thank you for your comments and echo and applaud some of your, your sentiments regarding um, the white South, especially uh, West Virginia, because I am uh, myself from coal country. Uh, my family was affected by the chemical spill and the public health crisis around it. and. Um, I also want to applaud this, the ideas and the um, hopes and attempts to reconsider the, the categories and the limitations um, and moving beyond just binaries and, and small groups. Um, in my experience, I've been involved with Berkeley for about five years now, and I found um, my ongoing struggle to be uh, representing um, my region, where I'm from, my, my kind of, my identity, and, um, we talk a lot about dealing with the disconnect here in our own communities and with the categories and groups that are in our own um, and how we describe them, how we quantify them. Um, but what about dealing with uh, the disconnect with uh, regions further afield in our own country, within our own nation? Because when we have conversations about the interests and voting against or for one's interests, how do we really understand that? Um, and I certainly didn't take offense to anything you said, but I find a lot of people having a lot of opinions um, about, and some are informed and some are uh, deceptively informed. Um, but but how, do, how do you recommend we move forward in having um, the curriculum be inclusive not only to the um, interests and groups that are represented in our own community here at Cal, but and the nation as a whole, because as we move forward to other institutions, we're not just going to other institutions in our state, we're going to other regions of the country, um, other um, microcosms. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, some people may not realize this is the 50th anniversary also of Freedom Summer uh, in, in Mississippi, and um, Berkeley students, including Mario Savio, who many of you know from the free speech movement, went to Mississippi. Um, to organize voters and to participate in, um, in efforts to you know, challenge Jim Crow. And many people argue, including those activists, that it was that experience that led to the free speech movement when they returned. Right? It was going down there and doing that work with, and getting their butts kicked in the South that brought them back to challenge um, some of the ways in which um, this university was, 
was stifling um, student voice. And so I, I think you're absolutely right that I would encourage, that would be a good thing to, to look at next year, right? Or, or this coming year is this Freedom Summer and, and those connections uh, that were being made. Um, I, I also think that, um, you know, it's very easy to um, turn your opponent to a cartoon um, and not understand the complexity. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in Texas, for example. And you know, Texas is a very conservative state, but you know what? Texas has had the DREAM Act <laughs> for years. <laughs> Texas has had bilingual education for years. <laughs> uh, you go down along the border, those little towns along Brownsville, uh, they, they've been fighting against the wall and, 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 and border protection. They said, these are our people on the other side. Texas is much more complex than people realize. Um, and and you, you only can appreciate that when you, when you leave you know, comfortable places like the Bay Area. So um, I, I would say it, it is important that we not, you know, we, we allow ourselves to kind of continue to be educated and see that the broader connections, because if you want to be a good political organizer, you've got to be able to understand how people are experiencing their social reality. So we have one last question, and then something nice to Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, again, to echo what everyone said, thank you so much for coming out. This, is, this has been a wonderful program. Um, one quick note on the, uh, on the thing of self-interest. Uh, actually, a, a very well-renowned professor, George Lakoff, um, has a lot to say about that. I would recommend that you read any of his many books, because um, he has, yeah, he, and he's inspired me in terms of being able to, to, to know what I want to do. Um, I do have a question. So I actually fundraise for the university. Um, and you know we're constantly talking about the fact that we need more resources. Um, and you've been talking a lot about the fact that you know many of the the ways in which we've you know been teaching the curriculum some in, in some ways stagnate. Um, and I, I want to ask if in some ways this is an, an issue of resources, um, especially when we have things like the community engaged scholarship, um, which have helped out. Um, I'm in uh, Professor Robinson's uh, prisons uh, course right now. Um, and that really does help a, a good portion of that. A couple of my classmates are here. So just what are the role of, of you know, increased resources and, and what are some ideas for increased philanthropy to you know, efforts like the American Cultures um, Department and Requirements? I didn't pay it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things, and maybe this is a good question to ask to uh, the provost, uh, Claude Steele, is um, can, the, can at least some resources either be raised or dedicated to the ongoing um, support of uh, faculty support for development of new courses and uh, in new areas that because I think it's so critical um, you know I can't say enough without the early support for American cultures that came in this would not have taken off the way it did right um, and you need to continue to do that otherwise people stay stuck in their disciplinary boundaries they keep doing what they're doing um, and so th there needs to be a deliberate effort to continue to cross-fertilize, to encourage. And it's interesting, you don't take a lot of money to get faculty to do new things. <laughs> um, just a little bit of seed money will get faculty thinking about new courses, and, and, and that needs to happen. You need to encourage faculty to read each other's work, to talk to each other, because that doesn't just happen. Um, I used to always be struck at Berkeley how often I would come to the campus during the day and no one was here. <laughs> because um, you know, if you're a person not teaching, they're not here. <laughs> and you know, not every university is like that. Some universities, there's a much more vibrant kind of campus life. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I think Berkeley suffers from. And, and, and you need to counter by doing things that get faculty in, more engaged and, 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 and talking and thinking together about these issues. So I would hope that um, the provost would embrace that. And so with that, uh, I want to thank you all for coming out here on a rainy Friday morning. I want to thank Victoria Robinson for everything she does for American Cultures here. And all of the staff that, that made this entire week possible and, and this day. And then finally, Professor Nogueira for being both eloquent and inspirational, as you always are, and uh, giving us perspective <laughs> and, and energy to move forward. Thank you.